We can take America for God by giving the ministry to laymen who are using their gifts to grow their groups, to double their classes every two years or less. We can do it by doing five things, by teaching a halfway decent lesson each and every week. Nothing less will do. You don't have to be Chuck Swindoll, but it does have to be halfway decent. We can do it by inviting every member and every prospect to every fellowship every month, giving Friday nights to Jesus, encouraging the whole group to be involved in these things, and by reproducing our group going from one group to two. The Bible says, get in the habit of inviting guests home for dinner. In the form of a command, God has said to us, get in the habit. The implication is, it's not going to work every single time. You need to do it commonly. You need to do it a lot. Uh, get in the habit of inviting guests home for dinner. And as we uh, talked about last session, the Bible says in another place, offer hospitality to one another. How? Without grumbling, right? Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Sometimes they'll make a mess. Sometimes they'll say they'll come and they won't come. And when that happens, you just need to continue offering hospitality without grumbling. I was a minister of education for 11 years. And so every now and then I just get an itch to do an announcement. Do what ministers of education do. So this is my little announcement time real quick if I can. Uh, I'd like to st uh, stay in touch with you if I can. I have some humility about whether or not I'm actually able to change anybody's life in just a short period of time. But I think if we give you, you know, give me enough, enough time and enough input, we might can make a difference. And so I want to invite you to consider uh, uh, signing up for an e-newsletter list uh, that, that I have called Teacher Tips. Uh, I'm in a lot of churches uh, week by week and read a lot of books about how to double classes. And I'd like to uh, send you an email about once a week on Challenge You. It's free. It's real easy to get on. It's real easy to get off. Just go to joshhunt.com and there's a click on there, uh, a link on there that says uh, click on uh, uh, Teacher Tips and uh, that'll come to you free. I'd love to stay in, in contact with, with you that, that way. John Piper uh, quotes a, an article from Reader's Digest that talked about a couple, Bob and Penny, he calls them, who took early retirements from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago. She was uh, 59 and he was 51. Now they love, live in Punta Gorda, Florida. Anybody here ever heard of Punta Gorda, Florida? Nobody had ever heard of it until about a month ago, but it seemed like everybody's heard of it now because that's one of, the, one of those storms that came through, came through that part of the world. Uh, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler and they play, collect seashells and they play softball, etc. And I would suggest to you that from one perspective, they are living the American dream. What everybody wants to do is to make some money and retire early and move to Florida through what's left of it uh, and, uh, uh, you know, live the rest of our life tooling around the Gulf of Mexico and playing golf and collecting seashells and so, so on. And I want to invite you in this last hour to give yourself to a kind of magnificent obsession to another dream. One of the most insightful questions anybody asked me, somebody asked me in Littlefield, Texas, came up to me after a conference and said, you know what, I agree with you, Josh. I believe this stuff will work. I've seen this stuff wor working, and I know that it'll work. It was actually in a Q&A &A, uh, kind of time. Uh, he asked this question, and I said, and he, but he said, here's my problem. I come to church on Sunday morning, both for uh, worship service and Sunday school. I come Sunday night, both for the worship service and discipleship training. I come to a visitation program. I come on Wednesday night uh, to our meal. I come to Wednesday night to our prayer meeting, and I come, stick around for choir practice. I'm on several committees. I come to work days from time to time, and quite honestly, my church cup is full. And uh, <clears throat> I'm busy doing some uh, very good things, and quite honestly, I don't know if I'm going to get time to do this. Not because I wouldn't like to, not because I don't think it's effective, but because I'm just so incredibly busy as, as it is. And uh, he said, what do you think? And I, you may disagree with what I sa uh, said to him, but this is what I said. If I was your pastor, and by the way, his pastor did agree with me, but I said, which I was glad about, but <laughs> he says to me, or I said to him, if I were your pastor, I would say to you, I want you to make this kind of stuff your second, second church priority. Your first church priority is to come on Sunday morning to both Sunday school and to the worship service and sing that as one block of time. Not thinking about your other priorities, but just your church priorities. I want this to be your second church priority. And if you need to, stay home on Wednesday night. If you need to, get out, out of the choir. If you need to, get off those committees and stay home for visitation. And stay home on Sunday night if, if you need to. And don't come to the work days if you have to. Stay home from all this other stuff and make this your second church priority. Now, obviously, you've got a little time to work with because you're coming to several things already. So we'd love to have you come back. And then, you know, after you make this you, your second priority and you get this, this done, you might do some other things. You might want to come on Wednesday night. You might want to come on Sunday night. And we'd love to have you. But 
I want to invite you to make this your second church priority. And you may disagree with me at that point. You may think that, you know, I'm just uh, kind of prom trying to promote my own ideas here. And I can respect that. For example, it's kind of hard to argue against prayer, truthfully. If you say, well, I think prayer ought to come, prayer meeting ought to come in front of this deal. Well, you know, it's pretty hard for me to argue against that. But here's, one, here's my point. If this kind of activity, giving Friday nights to Jesus and, and inviting every member and every prospect to every fellowship every month, is like your sixth or seventh or eighth priority behind Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meeting, Wednesday night meals, committees, and visitation, let's be honest, friends. You've wasted your morning and evening last night. You're not going to do it. If this stuff comes behind Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, committees, visitation, etc., you don't have time for that. You're going to have to move this thing up, and I want to say way up in your priority structure. You might not move it up as high as I would, but you're going to have to move this up and way up in your priority structure, or it's just not going to happen. Uh, it's going to have to become for you a kind of magnificent obsession. As I see it, there are four kind of churches, four kind of Sunday school teachers, uh, four kind of Christians. There are those who don't want their church to grow. Uh, they're actually opposed to the growth of their church. You might not think these people are out there, but trust me, they are. They are. I've had uh, some people uh, on my team calling people and, and, uh, and uh, seeing if they wanted to get this video on you can double your class in two years or less on a 30-day trial. And they said, no, we don't want our church to double. If our church doubled, it would mess it up. We like us four, no more, same as before. That's what we like around here. And uh, there's a lot of people who like that. When our church got to growing and growing rapidly, we had deacons who came to our pastor's office and said, Pastor, this church is growing too fast. To which sarcastic soul that I am, I want to say, let's get out the, the roll. Let's get out the list of new church members and you tell me who we want to exclude, who we want to say to, there's no room at the table here for you. But there's people that feel like that. They're actually, it's not subtle. They're actually opposed to the growth of their church. Perhaps a larger group of those who don't care. They're not opposed to the growth of, the, uh, of their church, but it doesn't matter to them. And perhaps even a larger group are those who have a mildly positive feeling about the growth of their church. They have a mildly positive feeling about this. It kind of makes them smile a little bit when they see a chart that's going up and to the right. But it doesn't keep them up nights. You don't ever find them out at a, a coffee shop somewhere scribbling names on the back of the napkin saying, we could invite them and we could invite them and we could invite them and let's think, who else, who else could we invite to this event? They don't ever find themselves praying for people who are far from God because all they have a mildly positive feeling and it kind of makes them smile when somebody walks down the aisle. Doesn't ever keep them up nights and it doesn't mean that much to them. And there's a fourth group of people who really, 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 really want their church and want their class to grow. And the deal is this, only category four churches are growing. You're going to have to want this stuff and want it really badly. It is not going to come easily for you. Somebody said to me one time, asked me one time, what is the hardest thing that you have to communicate? And by far and away, the hardest thing that I have to communicate is to get people to get serious about having fun. In a way, it's easier to do something hard than it is to do something easy. Now, that may seem a little backwards, but it's actually what the Bible says. There's a story about a man by the name of Nahum in the Old Testament. Elijah comes to him, to, uh, or he comes to Elijah, excuse me, to, heal, to be healed of his leprosy. And Elijah says to go dip in the, in, 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 the, in the Jordan River. And he's incensed. He's mad. He said, the Jordan River? We got lovely rivers back home. Why is he asking me to do this? I don't want to do that. And his servant comes to him and says, now, Nahum, settle down here. Settle down. If he had asked you to do something hard, this is not that hard, dipping in the Jordan River. If he had asked you to do something hard, if he had asked you, you know, to give, a, you know, give away the farm, you'd have done it in a heartbeat, wouldn't you? To be healed of leprosy. Why won't you do it if he's asked you to do something easy? And I think I feel a little bit like that because I find myself asking people to do something in a way easy. Uh, to give Friday nights to Jesus and to invite every member and every prospect to every fellowship every month. And I think in a way because it's easy, I think some of us hesitate to do it. We struggle to do it because, precisely because it's not really that hard. And in a way, it's easier to do something hard than it is to do something easy. 
And uh, so I want to give you 10 or 12 reasons why you should give yourself to this uh, the kind of stuff as a kind of magnificent obsession. And the first reason is because of the thrill of the work. Because of the thrill of the work, all right? I think Sunday school work is more fun than Six Flags. Amen? Let's try that again real loud. I only got one microphone in the house. I wanted to come up on this microphone, all right? I think uh, Sunday school work is more fun than Six Flags. Amen? All right, very good. I love the laughter. I love the tears. I love the preparation. I love the presentation. I love just about everything about it. And the truth is, if you didn't have any more noble, God-honoring, glorious, high-sounding goal for your life other than you just want to have fun in church, you just want church to be a pleasant place, I would invite you to give yourself to this simply because of the thrill of the work. A dirty little secret of church life that nobody talks too much about. But if you traveled in churches as much as I do, it becomes abundantly evident. And that is, because I'm in about 100 churches a year, about half of them more or less growing, many of them growing rapidly, more or less half of them not, not growing. And the dirty little secret is this, the growing churches are having a lot more fun. I mean, they, they, just, they just have flat out having more, more fun. I've gotten where nearly always I can kind of feel it. I can smell it almost. I can just tell by the amount of backslapping and the, and the amount of, uh, of hugging and the amount of uh, smiles that I see that this is a church where, that is pushing back the darkness with the light. And the kingdom is expanding around here, and they're just having more fun. In fact, according to the research of Christian Swartz, uh, he can even document, uh, written up in the book, Natural Church Development, that growing churches laugh more than non-growing churches. We've got the research to back it up, and I, and I have found that to be true. And if you didn't have any more glorious, God-honoring goal than you just want to have fun at church, I'd invite you to give yourself to this simply because it's a wonderful way to live. It's a wonderful way to live, to live in community and to live with having parties. And not only doing parties, but doing parties for a purpose feeling like we're doing this, we're watching this big fat Greek wedding, not just to enjoy ourselves, but also for the reason of extending love to people who don't have any love. I remember one time a year or two back, I was sitting back in, in this part of the auditorium in, in our church, and the Lord, I believe, brought to my remembrance several things for some reason that kind of just clicked for me that day. I saw a guy up here on the stage that uh, was playing the saxophone, and I thought about the fact that we had baptized him about six months earlier, middle-aged guy. And there was a guy that soot, uh, sat next to me in Sunday school that morning, about a 65-year-old guy that came to faith in Christ about a year before that. We, we had uh, baptized him uh, on the occasion of his wife's death. He got serious about thinking about his own death and his own uh, mortality and so on, and he, he placed his faith in Christ. There was another guy there th that day that I knew something of his story because he had, his girlfriend has visited in my Sunday school class. She visited, I called her, and uh, just chatted for a little bit, and she said she had visited that day with her boyfriend, um, and they had come to worship, though she came to Sunday school by herself. And I said, well, you know, what's his story? And she said, he's a self-described atheist. And I said, oh, really? I said, what's he doing in church? And she said, well, he's pretty much trying to just get on my good side and, uh, you know, trying to, you know, flirt with me, you, 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 you might say. And that morning, T.W. Hunt, who does seminars on prayer, uh, messages on prayer, that, that day T.W. Hunt spoke in our church, and I saw that self-described atheist at the altar praying. And you know, as that stuff starts to happen, you find yourself saying, God's not out to get you. He's not out to punish you. He's not out to hurt you by asking you to be involved in these things. He's out to make life a blessing. And the truth is, if you didn't have any more glorious, God-honoring goals, then you just want to have fun at church. I would invite you to give yourself to this stuff for that reason. On a more somber note, I would invite you to do it because of the lostness of the lost. Because of the lostness of the lost. And the devil who deceived deceive them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And as I understand the broader context of Scripture, everyone who does not call upon the name of the Lord will also be thrown. And the text says, they will be tormented. You know, it's not real popular anymore to talk about a health, fire, and brimstone kind of message about the fact that people will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But it's still in the book. The Bible still says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And we hold in our hand the keys to keep them from that kind of eventuality. 
Bill Hybels tells a story about a conversation he had one time with a military general who was reminiscing about his days in Vietnam when things were a little crazy and things got a little wild and he sent his men down in a particular pl uh, place in, in the battle. In retrospect, wrong decision. Because he sent them down there and many of them were killed. Sons and boyfriends and husbands and dads came home in body bags because he made a mistake. And he turns to Hybels and he says, you better be glad you're in church leadership because if you're in the military, you make one mistake and lives go down. And in reflecting on that conversation, Hybels found himself th thinking, would to God that only lives were on the line. Eternity is on the line. And I want to ask you to give yourself to this kind of magnificent obsession because eternity is on the line. A third reason flowing it away out of that second one is because of the sickness that is in our world, because the sickness that is in our world. My impression is the world is getting sicker. You agree? And my I've been, for example, to Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, a couple of times, actually, seen the bullet holes still in the walls where a crazy guy came in on a Wednesday night when they're doing a True Love Waits rally. House, a hall full, big hall, about the size of this one here to, uh, this, this morning, and a big hall full, full of people and full of, uh, you know, teenage kids. And uh, this guy came in with a trench coat. And at the time, they thought, not to worry, you know, this is just uh, some wild skit they got going on with these kids. They're always doing something for the kids. It's kind of wild and crazy. This guy's dressed kind of weird. He looks kind of weird, smells kind of weird, you know, but who cares, you know, it's probably just some deal they've worked out for the kids opened up his trench coat, pulled out a gun. Still, they thought, well, boy, they've really done the drama up right this time. Look at this. This is really impressive. Until he pulled out the gun and started shooting people, and people started falling to the floor in pools of blood. And you hear those stories, and you think, what a sick world we live in. And it's my impression the world is uh, getting sicker, and my impression is that the solution is, in fact, kind of clear in a way. What the world needs now it's love, sweet love. And as Rick Warren says it, hurt people hurt people. And it doesn't excuse their behavior. It doesn't excuse what they're doing, but it does help to explain to us. It does help to explain what's going on, that in, in a world of there, where there's an epidemic of loneliness, people will do some crazy things. And I think because of the sickness of our, in our world, if you want to give to your kids a safer, better world, I would encourage you to concentrate not so much in putting... Uh, metal detectors in your schools and or better sociology or better psychology, but sending your kids to those schools to love kids and love, especially love the outcast. It's my conviction that politicians fundamentally don't have the cure, that the cure does not lie in politics. It doesn't lie in sociology. It doesn't lie in psychology. It lies in this. God's cure works like this. God pours his love into our hearts. We all have hurting hearts. We're all uh, d dying to know what about me. Uh, and God pours his love in, in, into our hearts. And with hurting hearts, I like to say, I have the grace to put up with you people. And you have the grace to put up with me. And we can be obedient to the command of God to bear with one another in love. Because God has filled our hearts anyway. And if I come to church with a kind of full cup, a full heart, and I'm not coming expecting you to listen to me and pay attention to me and notice me, well, you know what? If you don't pay attention to me and notice me and greet me just right, it's okay because I came to serve you anyway. But if I come empty, then the church doesn't work so well. But if I'll come uh, full, then it works much better. And God's design is that the church becomes a kind of hothouse of love and that we share that love with a world that so desperately needs that love. Now, a couple of problems come, come to mind. Uh, one problem is many churches, some not many churches maybe, but some churches, and you probably run across these people, who believe theologically in the tenet of grace. They believe all the straight and narrow stuff about grace. As it turns out, some of them are not that gracious. Uh, you run across these people. I talked to a guy in Arkansas one time, and uh, we set up the details of the meeting, uh, time and scheduling and like that. And then uh, we're just about wrapping th that up, and he says to me, hang on just a second. I need to ask you a few questions. Okay. Uh, he said, tell me about your theology. I said, well, I grew up as a missionary's kid, pastor's kid, went to a couple of Southern Baptist schools. Pretty much my theology is kind of in the mainstream of Southern Baptist uh, thought. If you want to go through God, man, Holy Spirit like that, we can do so. But I can tell you right now that where we're going to end up, and that is kind of in, in, in the middle. 
And uh, when I get to the topic of uh, eschatology, the second coming, I will be a little fuzzy. I'll be a little confused at that point. But other than that, you know, I'm pretty much in the middle of mainstream uh, Southern Baptist thought. Well, this wasn't enough for this guy. Well, what do you think about inerrancy? And what do you believe about women in ministry? And what do you believe about King James Version and other versions of the, trans, uh, of the Bible and so on? And what do you believe about this? And I want to say, what do you believe, brother, about the verse that says, be ye kind one to another? You think that's the holy, authoritative, inerrant Word of God? <laughs> what do you think about the verse that says, let your gentleness be evident to all? Because it seems to me, friend, you're not being all that gentle. And many people, some, not many perhaps, but some of us, although we believe all the straight and narrow stuff about grace, it has not caused us to be all that gracious. And I think another uh, problem that uh, c comes to mind is that uh, some churches struggle to find a way to make relational evangelism systematic and consistent. And we've unpacked a way during, uh, during uh, this, th this seminar. A fourth reason is because of the epidemic of loneliness that we described last night. I talked about that last, in, last night in kind of a statistical kind of way. I want to talk about it for just a second in kind of a personal kind of way. Have you ever really been lonely? Have you? I'm going to guess, looking at you, some of you nodding, some of you have, and some of you had not. I want to say that I had never in my life been lonely. I told you I lived most of my life kind of on the inside until more or less recent chapters of my life. And I'm not going to go through all the details of that, but a more or less recent chapter of my, my life. And uh, we were kind of interrupted from group life. I mentioned, uh, alluded to that, that, that earlier. We're visiting church, but not really plugged in. There was a move during this period of our time and various things going on I won't go into the details of. But uh, at any rate, during this period of time, my father-in-law passed away. I'll never forget my wife shook my feet and woke me up. Uh, she took the call and then woke me up and said two words. I'll remember the rest of my life. Daddy died. I hugged her and held her. We talked for a little bit about some of the details of that. And then I started thinking about the logistics. I remember that her van was in the shop. My car had just gotten out of the shop. They'd done some work on the radiator. When they put the stuff back together, one of the hoses... Uh, actually, the heater hose, not the main radiator hose, but the heater hose rubbed up against one of the fan belts so that when I pulled it up in the driveway, uh, water was just going everywhere. At the time, I thought, uh, not to worry, uh, I can, it clearly made it here. I can let this thing cool off, fill it back up with water. It will easily make it back down to the shop. This is not my problem. This is their problem. And so not too worried about this whole thing. And also, though, I knew that there's no way this is making any four-hour road trips tonight. And I remember sitting down in my bed and thinking, I cannot think about, I cannot think of a certain single person on the planet that I know well enough to call at three in the morning and say, can I borrow a car? Do you have any idea what that feels like? My guess is some of you do and some of you do not. Some of you have lived your whole life on the inside and truthfully you kind of take for granted what you have. You don't really realize how valuable it is because you've never lived without it. And I just want you to say, I want you to know there's an epidemic of loneliness and it's an awful way to live, both in terms of not having a relationship with God, but also in terms of not having a horizontal relationship. And I want to invite you to give yourself to this because there is an epidemic of loneliness in our culture. The fifth reason is simply because we can do it. We can do it. The Bible says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Would you quote that verse with me? Let's fill God's house with God's word. Say it real loud, all right? I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Can you double a class through Christ who strengthens you? I need to hear from you here. Can you? Yes. Can you? Yes. Can you? Yes. It's an important point because Jesus said in another place, according to your faith, it'll be done for you. As some have paraphrased it, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, either way you're right. I had one person, another case where this doesn't work, by the way, another a lady came up to me after a conference one time and she said, I want you to know that what you talked about will not work in my setting. Well, there's kind of a sarcastic part of me that wants to say, it's working in Oklahoma, it's working in Georgia, it's working in Alabama, and it's working in Texas. What do you mean it won't work in your setting? But you know what? It won't work in our setting. You know why? God has chosen faith as the conduit through which he flows his power. And if you believe that God cannot use an ordinary person like you to turn the world upside down, you know what? God will never use you. But if you believe you, God could use a normal guy like you to take a class of 10 people, grow it to 14, grow it to 20, grow it to two groups, grow, multiply, grow, multiply, reach 1,000 people in 10 years, you believe that can happen? 
God can use a person like you. Now, to strengthen your faith j j just a bit, let me uh, show you some uh, graphs that are out of some books, I've read, uh, a book I've read recently out of uh, Tom Rainer's new book on the unchurched. He pointed out that 82% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if invited. You see, we have this picture of the unchurched that suggests that they're these atheistic, antagonistic kind of people. They're angry, they're mad at God, they have a bad attitude about this whole thing, and so on. And sometimes that is the case, but in many cases, that is not the case. Uh, I had uh, lunch with uh, one of my hosts uh, a month or so ago down in South Texas, and uh, the gal that was waiting on us at a, a restaurant there, uh, Carino's, uh, she asked, happened to ask, she said, are you guys from around here? And I said, no, as a matter of fact, I'm from New Mexico. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm doing a conference for this guy here. He he works for a church. And I turned to her and I said, by the way, do you go to church anywhere? And she said, yes, I do. And I said, oh, really? Where do you go to church? Um, let's see. I, I think it's uh, Angleton, a little town down in South Texas. I, I, think, it's a, I think it's Assembly of God. I, I yeah, that's it. It's Assembly of God. Um, uh, May 1st, or no, maybe it made Central Assembly of God down in Angleton or whatever, whatever it was. You think this lady goes to church? I'm, not think, I'm thinking she does not. But you know what? She's not mad at anybody. She's not an atheist. She's not antagonistic. You know what she is? She's lazy. And if someone were to invite her to come to a fellowship or come to church, in this case, I think she just might come. And truth is, she is the typical unchurched person. There's lots of them like there out, out, out there like, like her. Uh, I was up in Oklahoma on the road and had some downtime, needed a haircut, been on the road for a long time. Uh, and I got to talking to this lady and asked her if she went to church anywhere. She asked me what I was doing in town. I said, I'm doing a Sunday school seminar. Kind of led naturally to asking if she goes to church. And she said, no, I used to, but I dropped, I, I, now that I'm alone, I took that to mean she'd been divorced for just a little while. Uh, she says, now that I'm on my own, it's just, you know, it's kind of a lot of trouble getting getting the kids out and so on. She saw church as kind of an obligation and a duty and not something that would be a support to her during a difficult time. And I remember I told that story that night at the conference. And several t people came after me, uh, up to me afterwards and happily said, you know, what, what barbershop did you go to? But we want to go talk to her. And I appreciate that in a way, but also just want to say to you, you don't have to get the name of that barbershop. They're everywhere. Just look around. They're everywhere, and many of them are not mad at us. They're not antagonistic. Many of them are kind of open if we'll just, just talk about it. And the truth is, only 2% of us, according to the research of Tom Rainer, ever invite anybody in an average year. Only 2% of us. And the, the, we have the data to, to, to uh, support the idea that it really is true what Jesus said, that the fields really are white unto harvest. Now, doubling a class every two years or less translates into going, as I've said before, into going from 10 to 14 in, in, in a year from 10 to 14 in a year. It begs a question, and, why, and that is, why isn't it happening already? Why doesn't it happen all the time? Now, I would actually like to challenge you to a slightly higher goal, and that is to thoroughly assimilate two people every quarter. This breaks down the grand cause of world evangelization into a bite-sized piece that you can wrap your brain around. And that is, every quarter, you get your quarterly, and you ask yourself two simple questions. Who have I thoroughly assimilated, and who am I going to thoroughly assimilate this next quarter? And if you can thoroughly assimilate two people every quarter, you couldn't build buildings fast enough to contain the growth that would result from that, as I'll show you in, in a moment. Now, by the way, a thoroughly assimilated person is a, is a person whose name is scribbled on the back of half a dozen members' phone books. That is, this is not just a name on a class roll or something somewhere. This is someone I've had in my home, and uh, I've been in their home. We've gone bowling together, et, et, et cetera. 